Thanks for tuning in to the IGM podcast. We're so glad you've decided to explore God's word with us. We look forward to connecting with you in email at info at or online at our website, www.integritygm.com. We hope this podcast encourages you to grow in the knowledge of God through his word. Be blessed. Blessings to everyone today, and I'm excited about looking at Romans chapter 10, and I hope everyone is doing well, and we send our greetings in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. Today, Alan and I are are going to be looking into Romans chapter 10. Again, like I always say when we start a new recording, go back and listen to the previous recording. It sets the flow of thought, the immediate context of what we are talking about, and just in general... Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 are flowing as a unit. That's my perspective, that they're flowing as a unit, talking about the Israel according to the flesh and the Israel according to the promise. And when we get to chapter 11, there is a promise for the Israel according to the flesh. And it's always been about a promise. That's what we saw in Romans chapter 9. Now we're flowing into chapter 10, and we're going to take it one verse at a time. And Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. And when we look at the flow of thought, he's talking about the Israel according to the flesh. Because you look at verse 2. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. And I take this understanding of knowledge not in accordance to truth, because they're trying to come to God in their own righteousness and not in God's righteousness. So there is a zeal for God, but it's not based upon God's word. It's not based upon how God brings forth his righteousness, and they're trying to establish a righteousness on their own merits. So verse 2 again, For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, talking about the Jewish people, the Israel according to the flesh, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness. There's a difference between God's righteousness and man's righteousness. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to, to the righteousness of God. Now, when you go back and you look at chapters 1 through 8, when we get to chapter 3, we see both Jew and Gentile are both in the same situation. Sometimes we say they're both in the same boat. There is none that is righteous. There is not even one. There is none that seek for God. And as we look at what the prophets say in the Old Covenant, Our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. So if we want to know God's righteousness, it's not going to be by our own merits. It's not going to be by a righteousness that we establish for ourselves. The righteousness of God will come from God, and it will come by His grace, and it will be received by faith. They're trying to establish their own righteousness. Now look at verse 4. For Christ is the end, or sometimes it can be translated, for Christ is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And that's such a powerful statement that summarizes the righteousness of God. Because the law of Moses, its end goal, the end of it, The purpose of the law is to bring us to the Messiah where it's fulfilled in the Messiah. The goal of the law is the Messiah. So if we want to know the righteousness of God, it will not come through the law of Moses, who has as a goal the Messiah. For the Messiah is the end or the goal of the law. And as we look back into chapter 7, what does the law do? It releases us to the Messiah where God's eternal salvation, or I should say everlasting salvation, is fulfilled in the Messiah. I think this is a classic case of our human uh, nature getting in the way, and and the Israelites had the law. They, They saw God's power, His glory, you know, that we talked about in the last chapter. But 
they just focus so much on that and they got so much, you know, into it and just our, our own nature wants to do things to prove ourselves, to, to follow all these rules, to try to do it on our own. And they just totally lost the spirit of why the law was created. And eventually it had the end game of Christ and the Messiah's return to abolish the law, to give us a new heart, you know, a heart of flesh. Think about not abolish, but to fulfill. Fulfill, yeah, sorry, fulfill yeah. the law. But yeah, but they just, they lost sight of that. And then now it's just, they're so focused on the law, you know, waiting for the Messiah that that they just forgot about it. And then they didn't see it, you know, when Jesus came and argued against it because they were just so focused on the law. And to me, that kind of speaks to just the importance of not losing touch with God's Spirit and the Holy Spirit and don't focus on, you know, as a Christian, legalistic things or get too entrenched in debating on small topics, but really say, you know, God wants us to to love, you know, take care of the orphans and the widows. If you forget those things and you start getting focused on other things, you can lose sight of what the real purpose is. Yes, let's look back on the history, and I like to explain it in this way. God established a covenant relationship with Abraham by his grace through faith. This comes well before the law of Moses, the the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law is given to the people of faith, and it becomes their expression of their faith in the land. Now, they never kept the law, nor was the law to be an end to itself. That's one of the most important aspects of understanding. The law had to think about the sacrificial aspects of the law. It had to be done perpetually. The Day of Atonement, as a Day of Atonement for the sins of the whole nation. The law given to the people of faith so that they could be a light to the nations and build a house to the nations and be priests to the nations, to be a priesthood to the nations. Yet they never kept the law, nor was the law to be complete in itself. It had to have an end. It had to have a goal. So it was a guardian. It was a tutor that would release us to the Messiah. Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So what we're looking at and what Paul is teaching that is throughout all of Scripture, Old Covenant and New Covenant, is that the goal of the law is to bring it to fulfillment in the Messiah. It was never complete in itself. It can never bring about everlasting salvation. It could never make a person stand before God holy and righteous by itself. It needed to have the fulfillment of the law. The law expresses the holiness of God. It makes sin utterly sinful. It had laws about every aspect of the nation of Israel that they should follow, from the dietary laws to the ceremonial laws, the sacrificial laws, the judicial laws, the moral laws, the Sabbath laws. We can go on and on. All of these laws should have been implemented within the life of Israel as a people, but still, if they had kept all of the law, if they had been faithful to God, it was still not complete in itself. Its completion is in Christ is in the Messiah. So when we look at verse 4, for the Messiah is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That means all the things of the law that was never kept, which if they did keep it, would never make Israel complete in themselves, is now fulfilled in their Messiah. However, the Israel according to the flesh is rejecting God's righteousness Jesus is God's righteousness, and they're trying to establish a righteousness of their own. Now, let's talk about the law of that day. It was not just the Mosaic law. It was also the oral law or the traditions of the elders. So in Rome, there would have been a synagogue or synagogues, plural. What do they practice? They practice the oral law that is taught by the rabbis, And they give them a way of really being blameless before God by keeping the oral law. The oral law does not keep the spirit of the law, but technically a person can say that I have kept the letter of the law. And Scott, just to be clear, if someone's new listening, the the oral law was something man-made. It's not a scriptural backing of any of it. It was just made up by the rabbis, by the... Pharisees. 
Yes, I'm glad you brought that up because it is a man-made tradition, man-made righteousness that developed primarily in the second century B.C. that says that there are no more prophets And we as rabbis were teachers, and the law has come to us that was passed down from Moses all the way to us, this oral law. And we are the voice of God on earth, and that we can only interpret the law of Moses, and you have to follow what we are saying. And many aspects of this oral law breaks the spirit of the law that Jesus always deals with them, about you break the spirit of the law. You're keeping the letter of the law, but you're breaking the spirit of the law. And I think I have explained it in this way many times, if you have listened to me in the past on the recordings. How does the oral law function? Let me try to explain it. I'm a father, and I have a law for my children, and they're in my house. And I say to my children, I'm leaving for two hours, And I'm telling you, Shelby, Abby, and Cole, don't you go outside of this front door. Don't you go out of this door. I'm going to be gone for two hours, but don't you go out of this door. Now, what am I telling them? Don't leave the house. Okay. So I tell them that, and then I get back after two hours, and they're in the backyard playing baseball or playing some type of game, and I'm furious And then my children look at me and say, but Daddy, you did not say that we could not go out the windows. That's exactly how the oral law functions in many ways. So technically, they kept the law, didn't they? They did not go out the front door, but they jumped out of a window. But what did they break? They broke the spirit of the law, and by breaking the spirit of the law, they broke the law. So the oral law functioned in a way that you technically kept the letter of the law, but you're constantly breaking the spirit of the law. And that's why Jesus deals with that over and over with the Pharisaic movement. It was a movement that Jesus says, my father did not plant them, and it comes with a promise, and what my father has not planted will be uprooted. There's a promise that one day that this blindness that has come over the Jewish people will be uprooted. And I know that that day is coming. The Pharisaic movement tries to establish a righteousness of their own, where they can say that we are righteous, we are pious, we are blameless before God. Think about how Paul describes himself, his past life in Philippians. He says, from the nation of Israel, from the tribe of Benjamin— a Pharisee of Pharisees, according to the law, blameless. That was their system. He came from that background. But he counted all of his identity that was under attack by the Jewish community, the Israel according to the flesh. He counted as trash, as rubbish, in order to know Christ, in order to know the Messiah. So the end goal, the goal or the end of the law for righteousness comes by faith in Christ. And when we come to faith in Christ, all of the righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled in him. Now let's go on to verse 5. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. We see that many times throughout the first five books, but Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5. And remember, if you're practicing a righteousness based on law, on the law, and there's many, many Christians, when I say Christians, followers of Christ, that are saying today that you have to be under the law and you have to live by the law. Well, do not pick and choose which laws you want to keep and which laws that you do not want to keep. You have to keep the whole law. And he makes that very clear in Galatians. Let me read this verse again. From Moses writes that a man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness, live by the whole law. And you'll find out the law is not complete, but the Messiah is our completeness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Now listen to the next few verses, because he's going to be quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 12 and 14, talking about the commandments of God. 
So he's taking that principle and applying the same principle of faith about the Messiah. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring the Messiah down. Who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. It's not what you can do. Who's going to go into heaven and bring the commandment of God down? Who's going to uh, descend into the abyss to bring the commandments of God up? No, that's not what it's all about. It's not about what you do. It's not about you ascending into heaven to bring the Messiah down or going to the abyss in order to bring Christ up from the dead. Verse 8, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we are preaching. He's saying you don't have to go up into heaven. You do not have to go down and she- into Sheol. You Sheol. You don't have to go anywhere like that. The word of God is right here. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. And what is that? Verse eight. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. Verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth Yeshua as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Quoting from Isaiah 28. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's Joel chapter 2. So let's try to summarize this. There's nothing that I have to do to go up into heaven, to go down into the abyss. The word of faith is right here. It's in my mouth. It's in my heart. What is that? I confess Jesus as Lord. I believe in my heart because it's with the heart that man believes that God raised them from the dead. I believe in my heart that he's alive, he's resurrected, he's the resurrection and the life, and I am saved. Not by what I have to do in order to prove that he's alive or where I have to go in order to do something. I believe in my heart that Jesus is alive, and because he's alive, I know God's salvation. And it's with the heart a person believes. Now, that's one of the most powerful statements within the whole Bible. Think about if we go back to Jacob, James, the first letter written chronologically in the New Covenant. Even the demons believe that God is one and they shudder. You know, they have this knowledge, they have this understanding, they know who he is, but it's with the heart that man believes. True faith comes from the heart. It's not just a prayer that you say with your mouth, it also has to reside within your heart. What we confess is a definition or coming out of what lives with inside of us. With the mouth, we confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. What is being confessed with our mouth must live with inside of us. And so it's with the heart man believes. Yeah, and I think that that was always interesting for me and, you know, speaking to to different groups about it. And with your when your heart believes, it doesn't always have to make sense in your head. It's the interesting thing about that because you look at a, you know, someone being raised from the dead and Jesus dying and to wrap your head around that from a natural standpoint just really doesn't make sense. It's hard to do. Um, and I think when that heart feeling it and knowing it in your heart, you know, that's something that that only the Holy Spirit I believe, can produce in a person through hearing truth and then that coming into your heart. So that's why it's always, you know, we always try to say that Scott or I can't save anybody. It's really the Holy Spirit that has to convict when we can speak truth to them or when they hear truth. And yes, we can guide them and and tell them things, but we can't make that heart believe. That has to be... It's their faith. Yeah, it's their faith. And that has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. And and if you're open to that and you're seeking that, don't always, you know, don't, don't... Don't get to the point where you feel like you have to understand it in your head 100%. 
If you're feeling that in your heart, you're feeling that it's true, feeling God pulling you to him, just believe in your heart and confess it and and let him do the rest of the work. It doesn't have to be a full brain, head knowledge, understanding. Because like you said, Scott, the demons, they fully understand with this, this head knowledge but in their heart, they won't accept it. They won't believe that Jesus is Lord. Yes, we, we have to look at it in this way. You cannot separate your confession from what is going on with inside of you. Your heart is symbolic of who you are. It is a faith that comes from within inside of you, and it is something that you cannot separate that from your confession. That's what I was trying to say earlier. So a person can say, oh, yes, I believe in Jesus, and they're living in sin and living in rebellion against God. But truly, with inside of them, do they believe? Because it's with the heart man believes. And if your heart is symbolic of who you are and, and defines who you are, then a person can say, oh, yes, I believe, yet not have a true faith in their heart. And it's just a religion to them. It's just something that they grew up with a tradition. Maybe they have a head knowledge. Yes, I believe. But it does not impact their lives. They truly have not been born again, born from above, born of the Spirit. Because if we're born of the Spirit, we have what? A new heart. And that heart believes. It's with the heart man believes. And what comes out of that is a confession, Jesus is Lord. So you can never separate your heart from your confession, and you can never separate your heart from your life. Your life will reveal what's going on in your heart. What comes out of our life reveals what? Our heart. That's Matthew chapter 15. That's everything within God's Word. So it's very important that Paul says to the believers in Rome that it's with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. This is God's righteousness that is coming to an individual, that God's grace has come to them, and they believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, and they believe that Jesus is alive, that person is saved. This is the righteousness of God. It's not man's righteousness, which is not a true righteousness. This is the righteousness of God that has come. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And I've never been disappointed in the Lord. I've never been disappointed in God's salvation. I have disappointed myself. I, I have disappointed others. Others have disappointed me. But I have never been disappointed at any point within my life of this confession and this faith that comes from the heart in the Lord Jesus Christ because it is the righteousness of God. And I can take refuge in Him. I can rest in Him and God's peace has come to my life, and I will never be disappointed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And make sure that that's flowing from your heart to your mouth, and it's a confession that is flowing out of who you are. Now let's turn to verse 14, and we're going to try to finish the whole chapter here today. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? So this is really putting the responsibility back upon the believers with the Great Commission. Now, if you go back to chapter 9 and you think about that God arbitrarily chooses heaven or hell, mercy on one, and not having mercy on another person, and if it's not based upon his foreknowledge, it's just an arbitrary choosing of God, then why do we even go in the first place? Why would Jesus give his disciples the Great Commission? Go ye therefore into all nations. There is a responsibility on our part to be faithful to God to go to all the nations, from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And how are they going to believe, or how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Now look at the progression of this. How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? 
And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? There is a faithfulness to the call of God to go out with the good news. And then he's going to quote from Isaiah 52. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. And chapter 52 is leading up to the fourth song, the Hebrew song about the servant. And 53 is going to be the suffering servant of Israel. And what good news, the gospel is all there in Isaiah chapter chapter 53. So we have to be committed, and we have a responsibility to take this gospel to the ends of the earth, to take the truth of the gospel. If it's just an arbitrary choosing, then why do you even need to go in the first place? That's the reason why people that are wrapped up within Calvinistic theology, Reformed theology, they're wonderful believers. They love the Lord. But what I say to people, they're very handicapped when it comes to the Great Commission. Because we're going out with the good news, and blessed are the feet of those that bring good news. We do have the word of faith, and we're going out with this message of God's salvation, and we're preaching, and we're teaching, and we're praying, and we're laying hands on the sick, and we're praying in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, and we're wanting to see the miracles of God come forth because they have not ceased like you see in many of those backgrounds of Calvinism and Reformed theology. No, they have not ceased, and the gifts have not ceased, and God's Word is going forth, and there are signs and wonders and miracles that are following those who believe, and we go out understanding we have a great responsibility to bring the good news, and if we don't bring the good news, they may never hear. And you see this in verses 14 and 15, the responsibility that God's Word is placing upon us to be about His business to the ends of the earth. Now let's look at verse 16, and I know I'll get some fight back on what I'm saying there, but this is the gospel, and the predestination of God is based upon His foreknowledge. And God has, in His sovereignty, has given mankind free will and choice. And we go forth with the message of the gospel, just like Isaiah did to his people, Jeremiah did to the Jewish people during his time. We are taking the gospel of Jesus and going to the ends of the earth. And we know that as we preach and as we teach, the conviction of God's Spirit is going forth, and people have to make a decision. Are they going to have faith? And as the conviction comes, some by their faith, their hearts are open. Some by rejecting, their hearts become hardened. And God is hardening the hearts of some and opening the hearts of others, but is coming with the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's move on here. Verse 16, however, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? That's Isaiah 53, which is saying, who has faith? Who's going to believe of this suffering servant that is coming, that's going to lay down his life for the sins of Israel, and not just for the sins of Israel. John the Baptist understood this, but for the sins of the world. Because he said, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And if you look at all four of those Hebrew songs in chapter 42, 49, chapter 50, chapter 53, and the last three verses of 52. It is all about God's salvation coming to the world. So who has believed our report? Who's going to have faith? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of the Messiah. Verse 18, but I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Here in Psalm chapter 19, verse 4, it's about God's creation that is speaking about his existence, and you really have this understanding of Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Because from the very beginning, God revealed himself through the things that have been made. It speaks of his existence, but mankind refused to acknowledge God. And from that, God gave mankind over three times, leading to their own destruction. So Psalm 19 is talking about the witness of all creation about who God is. 
verse 19, but I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First Moses says this, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. That's Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 21, that here in Moses' song, that God will make Israel jealous by that which is not a nation, by a nation without understanding, a foolish nation, will I anger you. That's part of the song of Moses. Then in verse 20, and Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. Isaiah 65, the first verse about God talking about, I was found by those who were not seeking me, and I made myself known or manifest to those who did not ask of me. And then he quotes the second verse, and this is a understanding of the Israel according to the flesh. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient an obstinate people. That is the reality in Paul's day for the Israel according to the flesh. Now, there was a remnant that did believe, a remnant that took this gospel to the ends of the earth. However, as a nation, as a people, they are rejecting the promises of God. They are rejecting the promised one of God. They are rejecting the righteousness of God and the salvation of God that comes through faith. In Isaiah chapter 65, verse 2, Paul quotes this verse, All the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. You see the love of God for Israel, and you see the faithfulness of God to continue to bring the good news to those that are disobedient and are obstinate, but we see God's love continuing to work as he brings the truth to the Jewish people, to Israel. Yeah, and it's back to that, and we talked about it last podcast, but I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. And that's just, again, that's being a non-Jewish background believer. I would have never known Christ. I would have never known to seek him. I didn't have the law to point me in that direction and, and all the miracles in the history. But God in his grace sought after us, and this was his plan from the beginning of time. And you've talked about that, Scott, how God in his foreknowledge knew Adam and Eve were going to sin and fall in the garden. He knew He was going to need to sacrifice his son and redeem us. And I think that's just so powerful that he still seeks after us. And then back to the comment about, you know, Psalms and all creation speaks to God's glory and his existence. And just a fascinating thing I heard about a year ago is that a lot of sort of agnostic or atheist astrophysicists that didn't believe in God, however they figure things out through math, saw that if the earth was just a few feet one way or a few miles or feet, whatever it was, the other way, you'd either burn up or you'd be... Right. Completely frozen. And then there's no, statistically, it's impossible to have those exact distance, you know, to be that and all the planets aligned at the way they were. And I mean, just little, little things like that, but there's hundreds of millions of things that point to that. But then you see Israel in the same sort of dialogue who had the prophets, who had Moses, who had Abraham, who had the law, saw, you know, who, who, had read, the covenants who, who and saw the, the Red Sea parted, who saw these amazing battles won, who saw Elijah cast fire down on the prophets of Baal, or God cast fire down on them. So to, to have all of this and to still get lost and not see the Messiah, that just shows to Paul. You can see here Paul's sadness in that last quote kind of too, you know, all day long my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. You know, all of this is right there in front of them through their history passed down. They're still missing it. And kind of go back to the first part of chapter 9, where Paul is just, if it was possible, he would give up his salvation so that the Jewish people would know the Messiah. But yeah, I think Jew or Gentile, you won't have an excuse when you stand before God because everything points to him and points to his glory and his, his existence. Yes, and I like to see it in the context in which Paul writes it. It's from the very beginning, and there's a corporate understanding of sin that is passed down from generation to generation. So from the beginning, from the very beginning, mankind refused to acknowledge God. The consequences of that is it's passed down from generation to generation. But it's not God walking away from mankind. It's mankind walking away from God, and man stands without excuse. 
before a living God, the Creator God. And God has always come after mankind. And in these last days, He has come after us. When I say come after us, come after us with redemption and salvation and His righteousness has come to us through His Son, the suffering servant. So when we look at chapter 10, if we end in the last verse, we're all depressed concerning the nation of Israel and the Israel according to the flesh. The one that you mentioned, Alan, that Paul, if it was possible, would be willing to give up his own salvation, separate it from Christ for their salvation. And we know that that's not possible. That's not how God's righteousness is brought to individuals. But chapter 11 is going to be one of the most exciting chapters in the whole Bible about the nation of Israel, the Israel according to the flesh. And I call it a summary of everything that the prophets prophesied about. And I just want to read a little bit of verse 2. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Going back to the predestination is based upon the foreknowledge of God. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? But we're going to look at this as we go through chapter 11, and it's going to talk about a remnant that God has always had a remnant within Israel. But by the time we get to the end of the chapter, it's not going to be about a remnant coming to know God's salvation. It's going to say when the time of the Gentiles comes in, all of Israel will be saved. We're going to see a totality of this nation coming to God by God's righteousness, by their Messiah, and coming back into their own tree. Grafted back in, the natural branches being grafted back into their own tree. And what a beautiful promise and picture that we're going to see as we go through chapter 11. Yeah, it's incredible to think about it. The people of God actually accepting the one Messiah. I mean, how powerful when the whole nation turns to Christ and sees them as as their Redeemer. Yes. And let me read 11 verse 1. I read 2, but let me read verse 1 as well. I got ahead of myself. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. And it's going to flow in about his foreknowledge and the remnant leading all the way to the end of the chapter about a totality of Israel coming to their God through their Messiah and not trying to come by their own righteousness, but coming through the righteousness of God. And it's going to be incredible when we finish this chapter of God's mercy being poured out upon the natural branches. Now let's close in prayer and just give praise to God. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, that we have believed that someone did come and bring the message of salvation to us. And God, thank you for convicting our hearts and opening up our hearts. And thank you, Lord, that we were able to put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is our righteousness. And we do not stand on our own righteousness, but we stand in your righteousness. We stand in your grace. And by your grace, we are saved. And thank you, O God, that this lives within our hearts. And I pray that everyone that is listening, that they will have a true faith that comes from the heart. And what they confess with their mouth is a confession that is flowing from deep within inside of them of who they are, that they belong to Christ. And Lord, we confess you, we believe in you, and God, let our lives make a difference for your namesake, we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. If you'd like to learn more about IGM or have any questions about this podcast, feel free to reach out to us at info at integritygm.com and connect with us on Instagram at integrity underscore global and Facebook at integrity global missions. If you like our podcast, please share it and leave a review. Thank you for listening. Have a blessed day.